Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Um, as one of the largest economies in the world, the United States is a fascinating market full of opportunities. However, in a post-COVID era, the US economy is subject to an entirely new set of challenges. Gaurav Kashyap, who's head of EGM excuse me, head of EGM Futures, which is a subsidiary of Equity Group, is going to take us on a deep dive into the US economy. Gaurav has successfully launched three different trading desks and was instrumental in launching MetaTrader 5 on the Dubai Gold and Commodities Exchange. He is also a renowned financial commentator who provides regular market commentary to various international and local outlets across television, radio, print, and more. Today, Mr. Kashap is going to tell us about the future growth prospects in the United States, as well as the country's inflation situation, the housing market, and thoughts on upcoming FOMC policy. So let's welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Rachel, thank you so much for the warm visit. It's always a pleasure to be here at the IFX Expo. Uh, to all of you, welcome, and thank you for taking time out uh, to visit this expo. Today we're going to be taking a sneak peek into the U.S. economy, as Rachel has suggested. Where do we stand today, 14 months after the start of the pandemic? My name is Gaurav Kashyap. I head up the Futures and Options Trading Desk at EGM Futures, which is part of the equity group. And it's my sincere hope that this presentation will give you a high-level insight into how things really stand in the U.S., where the inherent risks might be in the future and how you can potentially navigate those risks. If we start with the overview of the US economy, the numbers are showing clear signs of a rebound, albeit at an uneven pace. Job growth continues despite a weaker than expected print in April. Consumer spending has bounced back with the continued rollout of the vaccine and Q1 output has increased to levels last seen a year ago. Consumption was the biggest contributor to growth while exports and investment spending on structures underperformed. Personal income got a nice boost in Q1 on the back of the ongoing government transfer payment plans. Savings as a percent of personal income reached 21%, while payroll employment growth slowed significantly in April, and the overall, overall unemployment rate ticked up in April. Core PCA inflation, the Fed's preferred method of measuring inflation rose to 1.8% over the year. The U.S. housing market continued to grow, albeit at a slower pace, yet comfortably above pre-pandemic levels. Equities continued their post-COVID rallies to hit all-time highs in April, while facing some unevenness in May thus far. While the U.S. dollar fell against the euro and yen, the overall dollar index, a measure of the US dollar against a basket of weighted currencies, is holding above 90 levels, while the 10-year Treasury yields declined through April and the start of May, but have since recovered. The pattern of the 30-year Treasury was similar and is currently trading higher than 2.3%. So all this sounds really good, right? At first glance, yes, but I want to take a deeper look into the numbers to see a more broader picture just in case the numbers may have missed something. But before doing that, a quick reminder of what our friends at the Federal Reserve are doing or what they're supposed to be doing. So the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate. It's to achieve maximum employment and target inflation at a rate of 2% in the long run. Of course, to do this, they have monetary policy tools like quantitative easing and adjusting overall interest rates. Now, at the start of the pandemic in March 2020, the Fed used such monetary policy tools to limit the damage from a deep economic downturn as a result of the pandemic. Early in March, they cut its target for the federal funds rate, the rate banks in the U.S. pay to borrow from one another, from 1.5% to a new band of 0 to 0.25%. This federal funds rate, of course, forms the benchmark for other short-term interest rates, and also affects longer-term rates. So the idea here was to lower the cost of borrowing for consumers on their mortgages, loans, and so on and so forth. During this time, the Fed also embarked on an epic proportion of liquidity easing, pumping more than $3 trillion into the markets, nearly doubling the debt on its balance sheet in just two months. 14 months later, and here we are. The data seems to be pointing to an uneven expansion. Jobs growth is on the uptick, albeit unbalanced, 
and inflation is trending higher. So what does the Fed have to say about this? At their last meeting in April, at the end of April, the Fed observed, quote, the, res the recovery is uneven and far from complete. And as expected, they held rates near 0% and maintained their 120 billion monthly bond buying program. Now they've maintained that one-time increases in prices are likely to have a, quote, transitory effect on inflation and in a collective sigh of relief for, fi for financial markets, reiterated that it was not considering slowing the pace of its asset purchases, let alone think about raising interest rates. It seems to me that the Fed is working towards its dual mandate of employment and inflation targets, but let's see what's really going on. The most recent jobs report from April showed that the U.S. added 266,000 jobs last month, while unemployment rose to 6.1% and overall labor force participation increased. I will start by saying that a read above 200,000 is a very decent print in normal times, and it is, one, it is only one month of data. If we look through the last three months, the economy added on average 500,000 jobs a month. But how is there such a big miss despite a higher percentage of the U.S. population being vaccinated amid slowing inflation rate, infection rates and lo local pandemic restrictions easing? Surely, this should have improved the labor market. There seems to be a growing mismatch in the U.S. labor market, and it's behaving as if there's little to no slack left. Slack, labor demand versus labor supply. Openings in the U.S. are at record levels. Quits were near record levels. Wages have been increasing at the same pace as they did in 2019 in a relatively tighter labor market on the back of the largest wage gains for the lowest income earners. Hourly earnings grew rapidly in April, and average weekly hours remain high. Now, typically, a labor market with this little slack would only get tighter as the unemployment rate falls. This is because the supply of labor is, e is usually relatively stable, so a falling unemployment rate is indicative of stronger demand. The current scenario is different, however, and there seems to be a growing divide between labor supply and labor demand. The current if you look close at the data, current prices and wages and labor market flows have the same amount of demand supply ratio as it had between 2017 and 2019 when the economy was near full employment. In normal recession and recovery times, the constraint on employment is lower demand for workers, but in recent months, the demand side of the labor market appears to be recovering more quickly than the supply side, as businesses are increasingly posting job openings, while employees have been relatively slow to return to the labor force. This could be for a plethora of reasons. From a demand perspective, perhaps after the pandemic, certain jobs have disappeared altogether, while other employers could be looking for newer skills. From a supply perspective, maybe some workers have decided to stay out of the labor force longer to spend time with their kids or go back to school. It's also very possible that these lower wage earners are happy to stay home and collect generous unemployment benefits. In some states in the U.S., up to $50,000 a year tax-free, a figure which would easily dwarf their minimum wage salaries taxable income had they, to return, had, they had to return to work. Looking forward, guys, the gap between the labor market uh, in the demand and supply of labor will no doubt converge, albeit at a much slower pace, in my opinion, than most people crunching these numbers expect. The economy is still 10 million jobs short of its pre-pandemic levels, as you can see here. And navigating this labor mismatch between demand and supply will definitely take time. We would need to see a return to that 500,000 monthly average over the second quarter to truly say that this U U.S. labor market is on the road to recovery. The second key mandate of the Fed is inflation, or what the Fed and many in the mainstream media are referring to as transitory inflation these days, and what has frankly led to the sell-off in the equity markets these past two weeks. Clearly, it's gotten investors and market participants very riled.
It's no doubt uh, a hot topic these days and on the mind of a lot of investors, this threat of inflation. A study of Google trending search words showed that, quote, inflation searches tripled through the early parts of May, the same period in which the S&P sold off more than 4% from those all-time highs. A recent survey shows that the median of US consumers, people like me and you, surveyed by the University of Michigan in April, expect inflation of 3.4% over the next year, the highest level since 2014. I do also want to point out at this point that there is a positive. Those inflation expectations do taper for next year to 2.7% for the next five to 10 years. Option traders seem spooked and are seemingly growing more and more bearish on the S&P outlook. The put-to-call ratio has grown by 33% 30, over the course of the past two weeks. There's no doubt inflation is picking up at a fast pace, at its fastest pace in more than 12 years, and markets are getting more and more sensitive to it. The most recent consumer price index, which measures a basket of goods as well as energy and housing costs, rose 4.2% from a year earlier, blowing the closest expectations of 3.6% out of the water. The month-on-month -month gain was 0.8% against an expected 0.2%, four times higher. So with the upward price pressure a very real phenomena, is it really fair to call it transitory, or is the US facing the threat of sustained inflation? Our friends at the Federal Reserve clearly don't think so. In one of a recent congressional testimony, Fed Chairman Powell said, quote, inflation's not a problem for this time as near as I can figure. Right now, M2 does not really have important implications. It is something we have to unlearn. Now, this is quite a callous view considering the Federal Reserve have, within a period of two months, doubled their balance sheet and propped up risky assets, resulting in cross-asset price inflation. Housing, real estate, stocks have all skyrocketed over the past year in the US. Property prices on the West Coast in densely populated cities like Los Angeles have increased more than 7%, while the shelter component of the CPI shows growth of only 2.1%. Even commodity prices, along with energy prices, have bounced back and skyrocketed. Lumber has been in the news, I'm sure you've all been following, rising more than 250% last year. Corn prices have also gone parabolic, and this will undoubtedly filter into other soft commodities. Cows consuming that more expensive corn will only increase the price of beef, and so on and so forth. Again, I feel it reckless to overlook this inflation threat, and that this massive easing does not, quote, have important implications. See, the problem we have is that the US government has accumulated so much debt on a federal and state level over the years, first from all the debt from the housing crisis, then the bank bailouts through these pandemic rescue plans of 2020. And in addition to this, they also have major liabilities like retirement benefits, such as Social Security and Medicare. So how do you exactly get out of debt if you're a government in this situation? You can either default on this debt, which clearly the US will not do, considering its role as the world's reserve currency. The easier way to do it, guys, is through something called financial repression, enacting policies that artificially raise demand for government bonds to lower the borrowing, borrowing costs of these governments. So lower yields on bonds are supposed to make it easier for governments to service the debt. In extension to this, one inflation, once inflation is factored in, already repressed bond yields turn negative in real terms, and the real value of the debt is shrunk. This means Consumers like us, our buying power decreases, cash becomes much cheaper, fixed income and bonds will also get hurt. Something similar happened as a way of the US digging itself out of the debt after World War II and in the aftermath of the Great Depression. Basically, interest rates and government bond rates stayed very low below the rate of inflation really until, in, until the late 70s, possibly until even Reagan took office in 1980. So you're looking at th almost 25 to 30 years of financial repression which kept these uh, bond yields lower than the real rate of inflation. And I believe that this could be potentially what we're lining up for. 
Now, if you own certain sector stocks or real estate, you don't have to worry about this as much because they will appreciate as the Fed's money supply is pumped up as this financial repression goes on. But what about other asset classes? How do they do in such environments? In my opinion, of course, very scarce assets uh, tend to really, really perform in such types of scenarios. We had mentioned that commodity prices have been doing well, but the difference here is if lumber prices go up, people will ultimately react to that by planting more trees. With corn prices going up, people will start to grow more corn in their yards and etc. So as these low to stock as these low stock to flow commodities are fairly mean reverting in price over medium to longer term periods of time. What are not mean reverting in price are high stock to flow scarce assets like real estate and gold. Gold has a high stock to flow and has in the past more traditionally been seen as a hedge for inflation. While some of you will definitely make the argument that this is changing due to the emergence of cryptos, we will save that discussion for another day. Speaking of cryptos, Bitcoin, which of course has a capped 21 million uh, supply, will prove to be another stellar investment as a future hedge against inflation, in my opinion. Real estate prices will continue their ri to ride their hot streak amidst higher inflation. The value of your house will appreciate, and this will also translate into higher rental yields, offsetting this potential inflation threat. REITs, or real estate investment trusts, are companies that own, operate, or finance income generating real estate. These would also do well in reflationary environments. Now, to wrap up, looking at how stocks perform amidst an inflationary environment. <sighs> when it comes to stocks performing amidst inflation, I wanted to share on the last data set, which I found to be particularly interesting. Now, this shows the average price-to-earnings ratios of companies on the S&P as compared to the various inflation ranges. So currently, we're in this range, 25 to 3.3%. From the chart, you'll see that the inflation rate, more than 2.5%, tends to see the sharpest drop-off in price-to-earnings ratios by more than 17% in this channel. This is the largest drop-off. And, of course, the drop-off continues as inflation increases. But inflation is not all doom and gloom for all stock sectors. Certain stocks do well in inflationary environments as well. Generally, pick up companies that are cash-rich and have the ability to generate cash rather than consume cash. Companies that have purchasing power that can quickly adapt and increase the prices of their products in line with inflation are also winners. Fast-moving consumer products like Coca-Cola would be a good example. And if the last two weeks have taught us anything, with the threat of inflation, avoid growth stocks and instead look at focusing on value stocks, which might prove to be a safer play. Guys, in conclusion, overall data may suggest we are trending in the right direction. However, unevenness and imbalances in the labor market still exist, and it'll take time to get back to those pre-pandemic employment levels. Inflation remains a very real threat, disregarding it as transitory, and history will teach us that sometimes this may be premature and highly irresponsible. I really hope you guys found some value in this presentation today, and for more such research, analysis, and insights, do come talk to us at our booth, uh, the Equity Group booth, and of course, I would be much appreciative if you follow us on our, all our socials. Have a nice day, everyone.